right, thanks for joining us today at Tech Talk. We're glad to have Steve Schill here. Um, uh, and I, uh, I just have a quick bio to read about him. Uh, Steve Schill has been working uh, on a senior as a senior scientist for Nature Conservancy since 2003. In this capacity, he worked closely with governments in the Caribbean and Africa on conservation projects, identifying high priority conservation areas, improving management capacity, and implementing monitoring measures. His passion is learning and applying new spatial technology to confront today's challenging conservation problems. Working primarily on marine conservation issues, he assists governments to design and declare new marine protected areas using information products derived from satellite and drone technology. Steve received his doctorate in geography from the University of Southern Cal South Carolina and is currently an adjunct professor at Brigham Young University's Department of Geography, where he teaches courses in remote sensing. And uh, if anyone has questions, there's a dory uh, under the word conservation. And uh, we'll save probably about the last 10 minutes for Q&A. So, all right, Steve. <clears throat> yeah, I, I graduated from the original USC, <laughs> University of South Carolina. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, yeah, who uh, is doing well in the NCAA, yeah. Um, well, thanks for the opportunity to come. Uh, I love talking about uh, technology and how you can apply it to, to today's conservation problem. And many, conservation is, is a really tough problem uh, to solve. And we really need uh, technology because there are some challenging, we've got growing populations, uh, diminishing resources. It's one of those wicked, what they call wicked problems. How do you solve uh, for the future? What, what, is, what is our environment going to look like? And it's, it's going to take technology to really solve these issues. Um, so like Rob said, I do a lot of work with coral reefs. That's coral reefs and mangroves are the two environments that I work on the most. Um, my uh, PhD was looking at uh, oyster beds and learning how to detect oysters using different remote sensing technologies. And I really like that land water interface because it's so dynamic. A lot of, there's a lot going on there. And then as I started uh, work with the Nature Conservancy, I, I focused a lot on uh, mapping coral reefs and understanding what technologies we can use and also how to monitor them, not only map them and create baseline maps, but uh, but how to monitor them. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But most of my talk is going to be focused on uh, coral reefs and a little bit on mangroves. So just to start off, you know, a lot of people don't under, they really don't appreciate coral reefs the way that we should. Um, so what percentage of all marine species live on coral reefs? So think in your mind, what do you think it is? And it's actually 25%. Um, even though coral reefs only occupy about 0.2% of, the, of the, the global ocean uh, space, they have over a million species, 25% uh, uh, of you know, biodiversity. They're, they're really the, the rainforests of the, the ocean. So which of these benefits do coral reefs offer our society? Now, many people think automatically think of tourism. You know, they love to go down into the tropics and scuba dive and snorkel, but they offer so much more than recreation. Uh, coastal protection, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Food source, a source of protein for 500 million people uh, around the world. Livelihoods, um, it's, it's all the above. And, and there's also uh, much more that, that coral reefs uh, give us, such as medical. Um, a lot of uh, pharmaceutical companies are studying coral reefs. Uh, it's The answer to this question is all the above. Um, it's, it's actually been uh, a very, uh, in the medical community, uh, cancer, a lot of studies have been, have come from coral reef environments and uh, we're, we're discovering new species and there's really interesting things that, that we can learn from coral reefs. Um, and coral reefs act as a storm barrier to coastal populations. And they actually 
reduce, there's been several studies on this by the Nature Conservancy and others, up to 97% of energy of incoming waves is, that energy is um, reduced from those barrier co uh, coral reefs. So they provide a lot of protection, just like, uh, like Hurricane Sandy. We have natural coastal environments, such as the salt marshes that absorb a lot of this, this energy, the mangroves. Coral reefs also uh, attenuate energy from incoming waves. So that's, that's a huge service for, for coastal uh, populations. And also, uh, besides all those economic benefits, if we add them all together, how can we put a price tag on coral reefs? It actually is 9.9 .9 trillion is, is the latest uh, literature. Um, but just coastal protection alone, I think it's $9 billion uh, in annual services that coral reefs provide. And if you think about governments trying to make decisions on whether they build a seawall or whether they invest in coral reef restoration, we're trying to make, make the argument that it's much more cost effective in terms of maintenance, um, in terms of all the other benefits that you gain from coral reefs, in terms of the fisheries, uh, the recreation value, storm protection. We're trying to get governments to focus on restoring coral reefs and not build that seawall, which will not only de um, degrade their marine environment, but it, it costs a lot to maintain those. Um, and governments are slowly realizing this. So you probably heard it in the news there, uh, a, lot of this, a lot of this gloom and doom uh, about reefs and how they're, we're losing a lot. And we have lost a lot. We've lost about 30%. Um, I work a lot in the Caribbean, and we've gone from about 30% coral cover back in the 70s, uh, 80s, when there, it was measured, it was a lot, there was a lot more coral. And now we're seeing 5 10% coral cover. And there are some areas where we're seeing comeback of endangered species, and we're, we're trying to identify those areas and get them protected. And so there are hope spots that we're trying to focus on and trying to understand why reefs are doing well in some areas and they're not doing well in other areas. We know a lot of it has to do with global uh, circulations. We know that overfishing um, is a problem. A lot of these reefs depend on like parrotfish, the herbivores that graze the algae off off the, the coral reefs. Um, the pollution is a problem. Uh, the rising sea temperatures is a problem. We're seeing that in the Great Barrier Reef. And reefs are resilient. If nature's resilient overall, if you give it a chance, it, it will come back. And uh, that's, that's why we're doing a lot of work to, uh, with governments to try to help them adopt uh, management practices that will, and and uh, best use practices around these reefs to, to help them recover. Uh, this is a lionfish, and you've, you've uh, probably heard about this. Um, it's not endemic to, it's, it's not native to the Caribbean. It's, an, it's native to the South Pacific. And this has been a big problem. There are a lot of theories on why this species of fish here, but it has no natural predators, and it has a very uh, big appetite. And, they have, like in Cayman Islands, they'll have lionfish derbies where they'll, they'll, they'll have competitions where they'll try to harvest as many as they can. And the spines on this, on these are very, so very venomous. So if, if you see one of these when you're scuba diving, you know, just, just watch. Uh, don't touch, as is the, the rule in scuba diving. But uh, they, it's a problem, and they're here to stay. They have a pelagic larvae duration. That's so that's the larvae in the water column will drift on the surface of the ocean uh, for 90 days, and it can it can be dispersed in over a wide geographic space. And uh, this is a problem because you've, we found them down at depths of 200 feet. Um, but whenever I go scuba diving, I'm, I always see them. Uh, they're here to stay, so we've got to come up with ways to be able to manage for for this. And so this causes a problem with coral reefs. We've got dead zones. Uh, these have been mapped around the world, such as the, the outlet of the Mississippi River, where there's an incredible amount of nutrients that are coming into the ocean. And, uh, and that basically depletes the water column of 
uh, dissolved oxygen. So there are these large areas of the ocean where they're essentially void of life. Um, there's overfishing. Uh, we have what we, we call sh a shifting baseline of, of what a big fish is. You know, when you talk to your grandpa, what, what was the size of fish you caught? Oh, it was this big. And that was considered big fish. But now, you know, as you can see here, this is uh, Key West, 1957, uh, 1983. You can see the fish are getting smaller and smaller. There's, there's more pressure. Um, our technology is getting better to, to catch fish. Um, and we have a shifting baseline. So a big fish that used to be like this is now this big. So we've got that problem. This is a, a news clipping I just took off this morning from BBC uh, showing the records that were set uh, last year, 2016, in terms of the, uh, the global temperatures. And everywhere in this dark red, uh, a record was set. Um, and this is kind of a disturbing trend. Uh, one that, that doesn't bode well for coral reefs, but like, like I said, there are hope spots. And as a conservationist, you've always got to have hope. Um, but we're seeing the bleaching that, that, that's going on. And corals can recover, and we've seen a lot of places where it, it is recovering, especially in the Caribbean. But if, if, they're, if, it's, if they're stressed for too long, then they don't recover. And this is essentially when the corals expel the symbiotic algae and they turn white um, uh, and, and, they, and they bleach. This is what bleaching is. And, uh, but it is, like I said, it, for large areas, if it's prolonged to too much stress, uh, recovery is very difficult. Now, how did I get into this type of work? Well, back in 1992, I was on an airplane and I was, I looked in front of me at a Time magazine that was left there, and I and I was uh, I was 19 at the time, and uh, and I pulled this this Time uh, magazine out, and I read about the the conference that was occurring in Rio de Janeiro in 1992, and that was the first time that governments got together and said, you know, we have a problem, our biodiversity is in decline, and it's declining pretty rapidly. We're losing a lot of habitats. Globally, we need to come together and do something. And they created what was called the Convention on Biological Diversity, where they made commitments to protect, uh, to, to inventory the habitats that they have within their country. 196 countries uh, signed this, and, and they made commitments to, uh, to protect these habitats, which in return would uh, protect these, spe these species and try to curb this loss of biodiversity. Well. In the Caribbean, in 2013, uh, 10 governments came together, and they decided, uh, well, nine, there's 10 now, at nine at the time in 2013, and Richard Branson, uh, the Nature Conservancy led this, this initiative, and Richard Branson said, why don't we all meet together on my private island in the British Virgin Islands, Necker Island, and there he is doing a brotherly handshake with uh, Keith uh, Mitchell, the Prime Minister of Grenada, and, uh, and they, they, they came together and said, we need to, to come up with a solution to this. And those countries pledged to protect 20% of their marine space and develop management strategies and develop a conservation trust fund to fund the management of these uh, marine protected areas. So that's what the Nature Conservancy is doing is we are working with governments to identify if you're gonna protect 10% or 20% of of mangroves or of coral reefs, which 20% which do you protect? So we use science to answer that question. We use a lot of satellite mapping. Um, we use a lot of experts uh, to understand where those areas are. Now, I, I want to tell uh, a quick story about, this is Louis the Loggerhead, Lo Louis the Loggerhead. And, and this story um, tells you the value of nature in protecting it and making this argument to the governments on, on what we need to be doing uh, to, to protect nature. And you can, you can ask yourself the question, how much is a live turtle worth versus a dead turtle? You know, in, in the Eastern Caribbean, um, you can get, I don't know, 400 EC, uh, Eastern Caribbean dollars for a bucket of turtle meat. 
Uh, in many of these countries, it's illegal. Some countries actually have a, I think St. Vincent actually recently banned the harvest of turtle, but it goes on illegally. Um, and so you, you ask yourself, you know, what's, what's worth more, a live turtle or a dead turtle? And this, this story answers that question. So I was in Haiti and we were talking to the minister of tourism. Uh, we were down in a city called uh, uh, Le Cai in the Southern Peninsula. And he owned this, this uh, restaurant and he was getting it set up. And in the corner, I noticed he was trying to build, it hadn't opened yet, but he was trying to build a little aquarium in the side. And I was looking at it going, I wonder what that's for. And we were sitting there having a, having a meeting with him, talking about how can we, ideas for bringing tourism back to Haiti. Um, and uh, there's beautiful, beautiful beaches in Haiti. Uh, and, and they're trying to, bring, tr trying to bring tourists back. And while we're sitting there, there were two men that came in through the back and they were carrying a turtle. And, and it, was, it was a loggerhead turtle. It was this one right here. They were carrying a turtle, and, and I immediately stood up, and I had uh, Natalie Zenny with me, who's she's a fisheries scientist. And we're like, you know, what's going on? Why is, why, what's the turtle doing in, in here? And the Minister of Tourism said, uh, oh, that's, I hired uh, these, these people to, to get a turtle so I could put it in my aquarium that I'm building here. And we were like, that turtle's not going to survive in that aquarium. And, and, and he said, well, I don't want that turtle anyway. Uh, just you know, go sell it in the market. It's too big. And it was it was a pretty big turtle. And and Natalie immediately goes, "You're not going to take that turtle to market. Um, how much do you want for that turtle? We'll buy it." And and I said, and and he goes, hundred dollars." He said, "I want hundred dollars. That's how much I paid these guys to catch me a turtle." And uh, and Natalie looks at me and says, uh, "Steve, do you have hundred dollars?" <laughs> and I. I had our dollars, but I said, "Well, isn't this going to encourage more, uh, you know, harvesting of turtles if, if we do this?" You know, uh, and she was like, "I don't care, Steve. We're not going to let this turtle die. We're we're going to buy this turtle." And so and so I said, "Okay, we're going to buy a turtle." And so I got a hundred dollars. I paid it, and and we took the turtle, and we uh, we said, "Well, we we got to get this turtle back in a safe place. Um, you know, it's going to die if 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 we don't do anything." And it was really struggling. They they brought it in and put it on its back, and so we got it. and And we I was with a team from UNEP. And when you're in Haiti, you know you have high security. This was several years ago, and you you go around in these these SUVs, and they have constant communication in case there's any security problems. And so we go out to the uh, the the SUV that's parked out there um, in Lakai. And the driver there is, you know, he's going, he's asleep in the car and we're banging on the window saying, open up. And he's looking at us, we got this big turtle. And he's like, you're not gonna put that turtle in my car. Yes, we are. You're gonna open up this, this car. We're gonna, we're gonna stick it in the back of the car. So he reluctantly got out, we opened it up. We put the turtle in the back and we said, okay, let's, let's go. Let's get out of here. Let's get to a, a remote beach um, and let this turtle go. And he wasn't too happy, but you can see the turtle was thrashing around and back and we were on these Haitian roads. It was quite a ride, but we eventually, we eventually made it to a, a site um, where it was, it was pretty, you know, this was an area that was away from a lot of the villages and, um, uh, but there was a restaurant that was there right on the beach. And this is where a lot of the expats from, from Port-au-Prince, they come and they, uh, they basically enjoy the environment um, and relax on the beach. And we pulled up next to this restaurant and we opened up the back and it was kind of an open air restaurant. So a lot of people were, were eating and just enjoying the sunset. And we opened up the back, we bring this turtle and it was really amazing to watch. Almost everyone at the restaurant put down their fork, got their camera, stood up, and followed me. I was like the Pied Piper. They followed me out on the beach. You can see them here. They're coming out, but there were probably like 20, 20 or so people. And uh, we put the turtle down. Everyone was taking pictures. And you don't see Haiti. Uh, you don't see a turtle very often in Haiti. But this turtle 
slowly made its way into the ocean and everyone was clapping yeah and uh and everyone's taking pictures and you know there are many areas in the caribbean where uh turtle walks are are held and where people come to learn about turtles and you think about the value of this turtle versus live versus dead. Um, Natalie and I wanted to take a sharpie and write and write, you know, property of Steve and Natalie, do not touch or something. <laughs> but um, we let this turtle um, swim away, and 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 hopefully it's it's still living a long productive life. Um, but it just it taught me a really good lesson of you know how people respond, and how you can have sustainable tourism. Uh, through, you know, tourism uh, that, you know, people can come on a regular basis and enjoy nature. And that's something that's, uh, that is sustainable and can provide livelihoods for these people. So now I'm going to talk more about the technology. That was my long, one long story that uh, I wanted to share with you. But you know, this was a study done uh, by NASA, by Woody Turner at NASA, showing about all the different uh, technology that we have to study nature. We have citizen scientists with their cell phone, they're taking pictures and geotagging, uploading them to, to sites um, that can be mined. We have drones, satellites, we have uh, collars that we can, we can track movements of animals. Uh, DNA is, is incredible. Uh, science that's evolved quickly over the last couple of years. Camera traps is another big thing. These are all these are all technologies that can benefit science. And I kind of thought about the top five that have really made a difference in, in conservation. So we have DNA analysis and databases, uh, camera and acoustic traps, uh, being able to, to catch illegal activities and transmit them in real time, mobile and smartphone technologies that can predict um, we're getting satellite data um, and uh, getting it processed and have real-time answers such as fires and things like that. Uh, virtual watch room, this is what's really been exciting, is these huge, massive data sets. Um, Google Earth Engine is, they, they house an enormous archive of historical 40 years of satellite data that can be mined um, very quickly, uh, unlike we... I mean, we, we couldn't do this when I was in grad school, but very exciting the things that are going on with deforestation and, and actually with, uh, with global fishing, um, there's, there's new exciting technologies that are happening. Satellite tracking is another. I'm not gonna cover all these. I mostly, I mostly wanna focus on remote sensing. And that's, that's basically detection of features from a distance and being able to extract information from those features. So these satellites basically divide light into slices. And because it's divided, we can look at spectral curves of how reflectance uh, changes over, over light, different light waves. waves. And uh, that's how we're able to map certain features because they look differently in the satellite. And you can see here, here's an image uh, showing certain bands. And you can really see through the water column because these are shorter wavelengths. They travel through water better. Um, and as you move up, you're able to detect different features. Uh, in the visible range, you can see through the water column, but as you move into the infrared, that becomes more useful for terrestrial studies, and that energy is absorbed in water. So you, so you can't see the reefs anymore under the water. So it's, there's a lot of information in there that we can use to be able to uh, map uh, features, uh, especially in the water column. That's mainly what I, what I deal with, is mapping what's underwater. So things like radar, there's, so there's passive remote sensing where we're, we're capturing light that's being reflected uh, off the Earth. And then there's active remote sensing where we're actually sending uh, energy down and recording how it bounces off, like LIDAR and radar. So in many er areas of the world, we, this, is, this is work I've done in Gabon, in Central Africa, where clouds are always there. It's really hard to map because it's it's tropical, it's very humid. You you always got clouds, but with radar, it goes right through the clouds. And and here's a here's a map a radar map of Gabon. Uh, we're mapping a lot of wetlands there. And if you zoom in, you know the radar interacts 
with the surface of the earth, earth differently, depending on what objects it interacts with. You can see palm oil plantations um, right up here. They're, uh, they react differently. We're able to map, we're, we're doing a process right now where we're mapping uh, a huge, uh, uh, what's called a Ramsar site. It's a wetland of global importance. And we're using radar to map a lot of these different habitats. And it's never been mapped because this, we want to be able to manage for this area. And you manage it unless we know what's there. Radar can also be used to detect boats. You know, they're, they're corner reflectors. You can send radar down and you can, you can really uh, easily pinpoint boats. And this has been helpful for illegal fishing. LIDAR can be used, which is laser being sent from a plane to be able to penetrate through vegetation. This is actually in Kruger National Park uh, where they're, they're mapping the distri distribution of termite mounds. So those small mounds that you see there are actually termite mounds. Um, so we're, we're able to map things that we were not able to do before. The, the resolution of the satellites is becoming very fine. We're actually able to do census on wildebeest. You know, before they used to have to take up a helicopter, fly around and try to count the wildebeest in Africa. Now we can actually detect wildebeest from space and be able to count, count them. This is an interesting um, use where in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we were working with the government to map the different habit, habitat types there. And St. Vincent, the island of St. Vincent on the northern end is a huge volcano and it's, it's very remote. And there's not a lot of people that live there. And when we got the satellite imagery, this was about 10 years ago, we got the satellite imagery. We noticed on the northern end of the island that there were a lot of white dots. We we're thinking, what are all those white dots? And this is an example uh, from the satellite imagery. And as soon as the Department of Forestry, they looked at it and they go, oh, we know what that is. That's, uh, those are ganja farmers, mar marijuana farmers that have gone to this remote area and they cut a slice of the slope off, you know, clear it, and then they plant marijuana and they grow marijuana. And we mapped over 300 of these and the Department of Forestry knew that they were there, but they had no idea the scale. So we were able to help map, you know, what's going on. Um, and you can actually see what it, what it looks like there. Um, we did actually did a hike across the volcano and uh, took a couple pictures. Uh, this is another interesting use of satellite imagery. Uh, this is an island in Jamaica that is part of the Pedro uh, Bank, which is a huge 2,000 square kilometer, very shallow bank. It's about an eight hour boat ride uh, in, a, in a fisher's boat uh, out from Kingston. And there's a small, there's three small keys there where fishers live. And they live in these shanty towns, these, these you know, metal, uh, sheet metal huts. And they live there for months at a time. And if hurricanes come through, this whole, uh, the, all these keys just get washed over and everything gets, gets removed. And they just come back and they build again. But they, they live out here and they fish and they fish and, and the Coast Guard boat comes every, every week. But we were doing a study to map the coral reefs in this area because it's, it's very remote. And uh, we wanted, we were working with the Jamaican government to be able to identify areas to protect. And I got a satellite image. And what's interesting is you'll notice there's a division on this key. We have half of the population living on, well, well, half the island we have where people live. And half the island is where people don't live, right? And uh, there's actually birds here. But when they need to go to the bathroom, the, the fishers, they go on the far, far side of the beach. That, that's basically the bathroom. That, that's the public toilet. And when they clean their fish, they, they do it down here, OK? And now what you're looking at is is the visible this is the, this is the natural color that we're looking at but when you when you look at the infrared we know that plants and algae they reflect infrared energy and you'll you'll notice that there is vegetation in the water right and there's vegetation where the where the fishermen clean their fish and we were able to detect from space the impacts of this fishing community going in the bathroom 
on that end. You can see that there's actually an algal bloom that's going on on the far side because of that. The red you see in the ocean, that's algae that's growing and floating on the surface of the water. It's photosynthesizing. Um, but you can see the, the activities you know, from space. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, so this is typically what I do. I, uh, this is my, uh, my boat. Uh, well, it's not my boat, but it's, uh, it's my office. <laughs> in, uh, this is in Haiti. And you know, we have uh, solar panels, panels set up. We, we uh, try to understand what is under the water, and we document it. And so I'll take trips where I'll, I'll go with my team, and we'll, we'll map what's underwater. And I use, uh, I'm going to show you, this, this is an area in southern Haiti, not far from where we uh, released that turtle. And we use an underwater camera. And our job is to identify what is at a certain location, what type of underwater habitat exists there. And, and we can see that with this camera. So we'll, we'll go to certain locations, we'll GPS it, we'll drop the camera down, we'll record this information, and we'll do hundreds of points a day. And this is an example of, of kind of the work that we do, and we, we take uh, this information and we use it with the satellite imagery to create information products. We create maps that have never been made before. This is bathymetry that is, is derived from satellite imagery where we, while we're going in that boat, we're taking depth measurements. And, and because we know depth at certain areas, we can create a regression where, you know, light will reflect at a, at a certain depth, it will look this way, the reflection of light at 10 meters or at 15 meters, it looks like this. And, and because of that pattern, we can actually predict depth. And then we can also use that information to predict what habitats are there because we have cataloged with all these underwater videos that we've taken, we can catalog where those are and then we can train an algorithm to predict what habitat it is across the entire uh, satellite image. And so we can see the distribution of seagrass, of reefs, different types of reefs. Sometimes we can even detect certain species of reefs. Um, we're actually able to predict species, uh, seagrass species. This is an example of a seagrass prediction model we, we, we ran in, in R, uh, being able to uh, map the distribution of this out spatially. And this information, uh, we run it through models to identify the places to protect. We use a program called MarkSan, which answers that question, helps to answer that question. What, if you're going to protect X percent, where is the best place to protect? And so these areas here, we identified as meeting the, the conservation objectives for this marine protected area. And as a result, Haiti created their first marine protected area in this, this area. We also use drones. Now, sometimes in the boat, we can't get to the shallow areas. And so uh, I was teaching a class uh, at BYU. And at part of the class, we, uh, we talk about uh, drones. And when I was talking about drones, I noticed that one of the students in my class kept correcting me. No, Dr. Schultz, it's like this. This this is really the story about drones. And and afterwards, I pulled him aside and I said, man, you know a lot about drones. And it, and it, he he was on the, the cheer team and he hurt his back and he was in he was in bed rest for like four months. And what did what do you do when you're in bed rest four months? Well, you learn how to build drones. That's what he did. He was on YouTube and he learned how to build drones. And I said, hey, if I get you a budget, can you I want to build a drone that we can land on water because I want to get over to some areas where I can't get the boat and I want to find out what's there. And so within a month, you know, I gave him the budget. He had this built. Um, I took him down to Haiti and we flew it around and it's that, I mean, that's a, that's a low cost. I'm all, all into low cost solutions. We built this on a budget of about $1,500, uh, all the electronics. That's actually a, a Tupperware top you see there. Um, but we can land this on the water and it's, and it's got a GPS pilot in it, a GPS auto chip that we can know exactly where it goes and we can record what's there. We also use drones like this. This is a Solo 3DR um, with a 20 megapixel camera that we can fly. And uh, we're training governments on how to use this technology. You can actually have a drone like this uh, you know, for under $1,000 and be able to map 
areas and be able to monitor them, monitor them consistently over time. But we're able to see, because as the drone flies over, it's taking pictures at different intervals. So if, if as it's flying over, it, it, it views it at this angle, it views it at this angle, and it views it at this angle, and it's able to actually create a three-dimensional model uh, based on stereo pairs that it's taking. So there you're seeing the difference between the, the photo taken from the drone and the actual height. So the red actually indicates higher elevations. And this is, this is really valuable. We can apply this in uh, mapping reefs. These are some of the pictures taken from uh, the drone, being able to identify these rare species and map them out. Um, we can also create uh, information products for governments. This is in the Cayman Islands, where they were thinking of removing a certain area of beach rock. And uh, this was really interesting. We flew this at about 400 feet, and you can actually make out the, the height of uh, uh, beach umbrellas. You can see those beach umbrellas there. Um, and this is all with the instruments that are that are a thousand dollars and less and less. So it's really exciting to be able to uh, train governments and how to use this so they can be able to monitor their own marine space. This is an example of drawing a transect through imagery captured from a drone, and we're able to actually look at depth underwater as we draw a transect up uh, onto the beach. Uh, so very, very powerful, not only for conservationists, but for engineers and people interested in coastal dynamics. We actually took the same idea and we, we uh, recently developed this reef rover in the Cayman Islands where we took the pilot chip, we put a camera, kind of a glass bottom boat approach, and we can set up uh, areas to map underwater and these are some of the products that we're getting. It's the same principle to an aerial drone, but we're applying it to a surface boat. And as it's moving in through the water, on top of the water, following a pre-programmed path, it's taking pictures. Every two meters that it moves, it takes a picture, and then we're able to reconstruct that using photogrammetry software and uh, be able to monitor changes in time. And this is something that has been very difficult to uh, capture in the past. Uh, this is some of the work we've done with mangroves. Um, real quick, this is the last part, um, capturing the health of mangroves using the infrared to look at uh, uh, biomass and areas of uh, photosynthetic activity. Um, in, in Gabon, we use these drones uh, with my colleague. We launched them off the back of a boat to help map and do ground truth over a large area of wetlands that was previously inaccessible. You know, in Gabon, you don't want to be doing a lot of field work uh, because there's a lot of uh, angry hippos and, uh, you know, the Gabon, notorious Gabon viper. Uh, drones are a great way to capture high resolution information. Um, this is some of our scientists. Uh, we, this is work we did last year where we were trying to identify different habitat uh, different wetland types, different habitats as we create these maps. And these are some of the images from the drone where we're able to identify mangrove, low mangrove, seasonally inundated savannas, flooded forest, um, and capture a lot of information in a short amount of time. And then we take all that data, we interpret it, uh, we create areas that we know certain habitats exist, and then we can apply it over a large, large geographic space. Um, these are some examples um, from that trip. But the government's using this to uh, make decisions on how to, how to best manage that. This is the surface model of, of that same area where you were, you were able to actually see the height of, uh, of the vegetation and be able to use that to, as a baseline to, to look for change in the future. So, you know, it, this is just a real exciting time. Um, to be a conservationist, because there's a lot of a lot of interesting tools out there. Um, this is my last slide. Uh, this is in the in Saint Vincent. Um, this is the kind of this is the kind of scene that gets me excited when I see these rare corals that are actually thriving in this environment, and we're identifying them, studying them, uh, trying to understand why they're doing well in some areas and not so well in other areas. Uh, but technology is 
is really helping us uh, create better ways to uh, map them and, and to be able to monitor them into the future. And this is what we're hoping to pass on to, uh, to the governments and, uh, and uh, have them continue the work of trying to protect these habitats because they're really important. So thanks a lot. Okay. Were there any questions in the in the door? Uh, okay. All right. You guys have any questions? Yeah. I have a question. Um, it seems to me that often people who have the you know the technology and that's like are on that reality probably don't know too much about the issues that come with conservation. Mm -hmm. and, then the people, and then the people who are actually doing the conservation at first probably aren't as aware of all the up and coming technologies happening, for example, in the Silicon Valley. What do you think would be a good way to connect those two worlds, essentially, or what could be important? Yeah, uh, well, doing things like this. Um, <laughs> it's, it's all about communication and, and getting out. and. You know, we have at the Nature Conservancy, um, we have a great uh, group that, that tries to stay on top of, of what's out there. And, and I think, you know, I know that there's, when I was coming here to give this talk, I contacted our California chapter and we have a representative that, that manages all the, the relation, all the relationships with Google, for example. And I think, you know, just, just managing that relationship and and communicating and and uh, there's the Google Earth engine that's that's uh, the summit that, that that's going to happen uh, in June and and Dave Tao leads that and has been doing it for several years and he gets a lot of conservation uh, people that come and and we just we just got to continue to communicate um, and uh, and I've got to recruit more conservationists uh, from the from the tech side. To come to come help me, but that's that is a constant challenge. This drones in particular changes so fast. Um, the, the technology uh, out there, I, I've got to just you know continually read on, on what what the latest thing is um, to, to stay on top of it. But what I'm really interested in is, I mean, there's there's big fancy Cadillac versions like like the uh, the Caitlin C Viewer is a basically a Google car. Uh, a, a Google Street View car for underwater. I don't know if you've seen those, but there are some areas that you know, on Google Earth where you can go and you can actually see coral reefs. They have this really nice um, camera system that that scuba divers will just, you know, they'll they'll float through the water column and capture these pictures just like Google Street cars, and and that's great. But that's hard to replicate widely and and be able to use it as a management tool in a lot of places. So I'm I'm really interested in what can we do for a thousand dollars, you know, that can be replicated and can capture really valuable information that can be used for management decision making. Uh, you know that that's why I'm constantly, you know, looking at what's out there to see if we can adapt it, like that reef rover, the Cayman Islands. We built that. We we got a grant, and we built that. Um, it, we it, that was fifteen hundred dollars to build that using parts that we got off the internet and put it together. And uh, now the Cayman Islands is using it to, to map areas of, you know, where, where a ship will ground into a reef and they want to map the damage, um, or they're interested in how a storm has affected uh, how reefs have, have broken off in the energy of the storm, and they'll, they'll send it out there. Um, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm really interested in trying to use, trying to develop cost-effective tools that can be, I can pass the capacity on to our partners who can carry out the monitoring because we can't do it all. We need, we need tools that are replicable and, and, and people can use easily. Yeah. That was a long answer, but I hope that got to it. Yeah. Um, I, I guess it's kind of a vague question. So a lot of what you've discussed is gathering and creating data. And yeah. I was like mentally at least wondering Okay, but then what? Like, how does that link to conservation? You've mentioned like decision making and monitoring and yeah. all that. Could you like 
perhaps help me to be more concrete in like we got information how does that turn into conservation yeah, yeah. so so like like that's a great question um like these countries are are hungry for information right a lot of them they don't ha they don't really know where their reefs are where the fishers know where the reefs are but it's all in their head you know they you can tell them anything and a lot of the times we take our maps and we say is this accurate and they can some some of them have a hard time relating to a map because they're not used to it but um you know we're trying to help the governments make the decision they've made this commitment they need to protect 20 percent of their marine space what's the best 20 percent to protect now understanding where your resources are is very important so creating those maps knowing the distribution of those maps but not only knowing where they are but knowing what services they are providing so we run this through models and we we identify are the the coral reefs or the mangroves that are providing the most benefits in terms of fisheries in terms of storm protection when waves come in they're they're absorbing that energy and they're, they're protecting communities um, you know where are where are the tourists going and we're actually mining uh the Flickr database these social uh photo sites where people go out and take pictures with their smartphone and they upload them we're mining those to understand and we run them through algorithms to understand you know which ones are underwater which ones aren't um, to know uh, the footprint of tourism and, and where, where people go to enjoy reefs um, so we're trying to create information products to be able to run them through models to be able to give to the decision maker and the government saying okay these are our recommendations for where you need to protect and it's such a great feeling when like in Haiti where we're able to take the outputs of our model and that was signed into law within six months they created Haiti's first marine protected area so now we're working with them to get them funding to be able to actually manage because if it's not managed it's, it's not worth having a park there um, so in working with the fishers working with the communities for the most part they really understand that they need to do something because they're on a trajectory that's not sustainable um, there's not going to be any fish left in the ocean if they continue in certain paths or if their reefs continue to die so for the most part, you know they know they know there's a problem. They want to do something, so they're eager for help. They're eager for ways to adjust and uh, figure out how to be more sustainable. So we're these information products are helping them with that. Any questions? All right. Yeah. All right. Hi. Hello. Um, so I am interested in nature, and I. And I, I do have like, <laughs> yeah. I do have a GIS background. So I'm oh, curious, yeah. oh, like, cool. I mean, we, we actually work on Google Maps stuff oh, awesome. and Earth Engine. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm curious, like, um, how can we give back to the community in terms of like, what kind of like volunteer opportunities are there that we can do on the side to like, you know, during our downtime that may help in terms of like mapping, processing and things like that, you know, which, I guess, which areas or which websites or whatever would be yeah. good. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of crowdsourcing things out there and a lot of them are mostly for like natural disasters and things like that. But I would love to see, um, a platform that was specifically, set up maybe and maybe it's out there i just don't know about it where where communities can go on and and you know map certain things i mean because sometimes it's pretty easy to detect certain features that are important like in nature or in the nature conservancy we map the habitats we map you know where protected areas are and we need to know where those are and then we map the threats to the habitats and so mapping the human footprint is really important and i've actually employed a lot of students who have done a lot of work, you know, mapping roads and buildings and actually finding areas where where people are going into rivers where they're illegally fishing within a park and using that information and giving that to the rangers so they can do more effective patrols. So I think crowdsourcing, um, you know, apps are a real great way to, to help with that. I just don't know if those are out there, um, but maybe that's something that, that we can we can work uh, with our tech uh, organizations like Google to, to figure out how to do that. But, um, you know, other than, you know, I'm sure the Nature Conservancy has has uh, city events and um, activities. I, um, I'm not really 
involved with, with the activities here in California, but I know in each chapter in every state they have activities where they have beach cleanups and um, things like that, but um, um, yeah, I, that, that's something that, that, that I'd like to pursue more and, and get, get more opportunities for people who want to contribute too. So if you hear about anything, let me know. It sounds like Earth Engine's a good tool too, so keep working on that. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping to come in June to Google Earth Engine. Uh, I don't know what your percentage of people that are doing it for conservation, but it's mainly geared toward NGOs. Uh, it seems like, yeah. So, yeah. All right. Anything else? Thank you very much. Well, thank you. All right. <laughs>